Greetings, Rob Chastner here, continuing our study verse by verse with commentary in the book of Romans. So if you're following along, uh, we're in Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 18. Romans 8, verse 18. <clears throat> the, the Apostle Paul, previous to this, has been taking us to the point where you and I were born enemies of God. Paul said in Ephesians 2, verse 3, we all once lived in the passion of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and mind, and were, were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So, um, as he said in Ephesians, we were born enemies of God. As we have discussed in previous teachings, uh, there is an unfair element here because none of us signed up to uh, 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 to be an enemy of God. None of us were consulted first. None of us were even asked, do you want to be an enemy of God? <clears throat> but as, fair, as unfair as that is, God is even more fair than the unfairness that we've been given. He has brought forth a means of salvation, and it's simple. You trust in the finished work of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. Not only will you be forgiven of your war against God, but you will also be adopted into the family of God and adopted to such a degree that the writer of Hebrews said in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11, both the one who makes people holy <clears throat> And those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. <coughs> Think about that. You are a brother or a sister of Jesus Christ. So you have changed your family. When we were in the family of Adam, there were different priorities. Um, you ever notice how how different families have different priorities they have you know some families uh their priorities are athletics and so their kids are always involved in team sports and and team activities and you know there's trophies all over the house um, for that participation other families are uh have priorities in academics and so those kids are always involved in spelling bees and they're involved in uh, science fair projects and things of that nature. Um, and so um, our priority as being a family uh, of God is uh, different than our priorities were when we were a family of Adam. So the priorities before were all about money and power and sexuality and control and all self-centered types of uh, gratification. But now we have been adopted into the family of God and the family of God, the priority is the life which is coming next. It is about the life not in this world. The priority is getting ready for the life to come. Now, because that is our priority, we can get on the nerves of family members, uh, friends, uh, co-workers. And what does that result? It results in rejection, difficulties, pain, and sorrow in our lives. But what do we do with the struggles? What do we do with the rejection? What do we do with the pain and the sorrow? This is where Paul will take us now in Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 18. Verse 18 says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Now, Paul is an analytical kind of guy. He is thinking about those things that I have given up. Uh, what has Christianity or what has Messianic Judaism cost me? And is it a good deal? Paul is thinking, and he's writing here, am I going to be <clears throat> the loser here? Or am I going to be the winner here? Now notice Paul uses the word worthy 
in this verse. This comes out of, a, of the marketplace in the Greek language. Uh, hopefully I can say this right. Uh, uh, axios. axios. Uh, it means to weigh. It means to measure. It means to assign a matching value. In other words, worth to worth. So uh, it's an assessment uh, in keeping with something that weighs in on God's balance scale of truth. So, um, so picture, if you would, a, um, a scale that has uh, a balance scale. It has two, two sides to it, and, and you put something on one side, and the other side goes like this. Okay, so you can picture that. Uh, so a balance scale. Um, and so you put everything on one side that, that it costs you. It has cost you to be a Christian or a Messianic Jew. Perhaps you lost a job because your boss told you to do something that was unethical and you took a stand to do what was right and you were fired. Perhaps you were in a marriage where you became a believer and the other one did not. And so there was friction and and so forth, and it, and it cost you a marriage. Perhaps it, it cost you rejection from your family <coughs> uh, or your friends. And then put on the other side of that scale uh, what the glory which will be revealed to us at the resurrection. Uh, and notice what Paul says there is that there is no comparison. <coughs> what is going to be revealed in us is going to be absolutely mind-blowing and it was so mind-blowing that this analytical guy Paul could not write about it or describe it in human terms now you can say well that was Paul he hasn't suffered like I have if you look in the New Testament and you you read about the various things that happened to Paul Paul has gone through beatings he's gone through shipwrecks he's gone through imprisonment uh, imprisonments and and eventually he's going to be decapitated killed and although this man suffered more than almost any other man suffered in history he says you are not even in the same ballpark if you are going to attempt to compare what you are going to have in the resurrection to some dif uh, kind of difficulty you are experiencing um, uh, in, in, in your life right now so whatever it is you're experiencing right now with the rejection or uh, what kind of suffering for being a believer in God, that suffering does not compare. It pales to what the glory will be when uh, we are at the resurrection. Notice as we move forward now, starting in verse 19, he is going to describe three people who are going to be groaning. So let's look at verses 19 through 22. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be uh, liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And so creation is groaning. When Adam fell, creation fell with him. And creation is redeemed when we are redeemed. Notice it says that all of creation has been subject, uh, subjected or subject until the revealing, until the manifestation. What is that all about? Notice in verse 23, not only so, but our, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption of sonship, the redemption of our bodies. You get older, you groan more. Remember when you were a kid and you couldn't figure out why older people groan so much. They groan when they're getting in the car. They groan when they're getting out of the car. They groan when they're sitting down in the chair. They groan when they're standing up. They groan when they bend over to tie their shoe. They groan when they get back up from tying their shoe. The older we get, 
the more we realize what it what that is that's going on we groan physically we groan emotionally when people lose a parent or a child or a spouse or a friend there's emotional heartache and we groan for those who we who we lost we groan spiritually when we are comforted uh, sorry when we're confronted by our own weakness such as uh, uh, gosh I wish I could be a better man a better husband a better disciple we groan um, Notice here that Paul says that we are going to be groaning until when? The redemption of our body. That is the manifestation which Paul is talking about. Um, back in the 1950s and the 1960s, there was a doctor who was getting involved in some of these French Pentecostal groups. Uh, it was known as the Doctrine of Manifestation of the Sons of God. And they were saying that the more that you were filled with the Spirit of God, you became a more glorious disciple, and finally you could become filled with the Spirit, and then we are going to take over the world and make it right in order that Jesus can return. Um, another author, Ern Baxter, at the National Men's Shepherds Conference wrote, quote, God's people are going to start to exercise rule and they are going to take <clears throat> dominion over the power of Satan. They are going to bring diabolical princes down. The dark powers that hover over the parliament buildings of the nations are going to be paralyzed by the corporate prayer of, the, of an author, authoritative community. As the rod of his strength goes out on Zion, he will change legislation he will chase off the devil chase the devil off the face of, the, of god's earth <clears throat> and god's people together doing the will of god will bring about god's purpose and god's reign end of quote uh another author paul cain in his book joel's army on page 218 said quote not only will they not have disease they will also not die they will have the kind of imperishable bodies that are talked about in the 15th chapter of Corinthians. This army is invincible. If you have intimacy with God, they cannot kill you. End of quote. Now, can you imagine a more pornographic statement than that? It's, you know, if you have intimacy with God, you cannot be killed. Are you going to tell me that the brothers and the sisters that we have in Syria and in the Arab nations and all around the world that are being held hostage and then they're being butchered <coughs> troops or missionaries <coughs> you're telling me they don't have intimacy with God <coughs> are you going to tell me that the churches in North Africa and North Korea that they do not have intimacy with God see so those those are horrible statements you can't re you can't um, believe everything that you read, you have to go to scripture to find out the truth. What Paul is talking about here in this scripture, he is talking about the resurrection. So uh, that you and I are going to be groaning and longing for the resurrection. <clears throat> He's not talking about your body in this life. He's talking about the resurrection into uh, the kingdom of God where eternity uh, goes, goes on. And all of creation with us, because in the resurrection, notice what it says now in verses 24 and, uh, and 25. For in this hope we are saved. We were saved. But hope that is seen is not hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not have, we wait for it patiently. Okay, in other words, you don't hope for what you already have or for what you already have experienced. You hope for the resurrection because it has not yet happened. And notice who is also is groaning now in verses 26 and 27. Uh, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us uh, through wordless groans and he who searches our hearts 
knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Let's notice a couple of things here in these verses about the Holy Spirit. Notice first that he says the Holy Spirit himself. He doesn't say the Holy Spirit itself. The Holy Spirit is a person. Notice it says that the Holy Spirit helps us. It is a very interesting word from from the Greek language. Um, And it's only used actually in one other place in the New Testament. If you remember the two sisters, Mary and Martha, uh, they were kind of going at it uh, with each other. And you remember Martha was a type A personality. She was going to get in there and get him. Uh, Mary was a, a, a more thoughtful individual, and so she was sitting in a Bible study with Jesus. Martha's working feverishly in the kitchen. The longer she works, the more ticked off she becomes, and finally she breaks up the Bible study with Jesus and says, Don't you care? Do you not understand what's going on in my life here? Interesting. She calls him Lord. She says, Lord, you tell her to get her get in here and help me. So he's calling him, she's calling him Lord, but yet she's handing out commands to him. That is the same word uh, uh, that is being used here. Martha was not asking for Mary to go into the kitchen and do everything. She was simply asking Mary to go into the kitchen to be an assistant to Martha, helping her with the project. This is the same word used in these verses here in Romans. The Holy Spirit is coming into our lives and removing from us uh, all of the burdens which were upon us and all the burden uh, is being placed solely on him. That's not what's going on here. The imagery here is you get uh, uh, that end, I'll get this end, and let's live together. That's the imagery. It's cooperation. It's teamwork. Now, what specifically is the Holy Spirit helping us with? Notice it says there that we have a weakness. What is the weakness? Well, we don't know how we are to pray all of the time. There are many situations where you just don't know what to pray, what to say. Uh, Here is where the ministry of the Holy Spirit comes in and helps us to pray. Now, there are three potential interpretations on how this works. The first would be we ask the Father. He would give us the Holy Spirit to guide us in our prayer life. And so we begin to pray, Father, I ask for the Holy Spirit to come into my life and bring to my vocabulary and my mind those things which I I need to be praying and how I should be praying. But notice that it does not say that it doesn't really fit this situation Um, because Paul uses an interesting Uh, some interesting language here. Notice he says it cannot be uttered, which means it cannot be words expressed. In other words, uh, I am saying to God, guide my vocabulary as I pray, but in this situation, vocabulary is not being used, and so uh, words are not being spoken. So therefore, that particular interpretation does not fit. Another one would say uh, this, this is speaking about the Holy Spirit's prayer language, which is, which the believer can experience, and we, uh, and we would call that the gift of tongues. Now here, we need to be reminded in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 29 and 30, which says, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all have gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret. Of course, the answer is no. But notice that Paul uses our, the Holy Spirit helps us with our weakness. Well, who is our? Our is everybody, Paul and the entire church of Rome. Uh, It seems that what Paul is talking about here is that this is available to all of the believers, and clearly the gift of tongues is not for all believers, so the gift of tongues does not fit into this either. Remember, Paul also said in 1 Corinthians 14, 14, he says, for I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So when you speak in tongues, whose spirit is doing the talking? Your spirit is doing the talking. 
What did the verse just tell us? And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes and for God's people in accordance with the willing of God. So who is doing the praying here? The Holy Spirit is doing the praying. All right, so that doesn't fit. Now, the third possibility is groaning is just groaning. And likely how it works is when we have something that weighs heavily upon us, so heavily that you just begin to groan. And when you groan, you just say to the, to the Lord, you interpret that groan however you want to interpret it. I don't know what to pray for uh, uh, here. I don't know uh, uh, what needs to be done. I am reduced to groaning. And so I suppose I'm groaning in faith and, you know, and, and ask God to uh, that that may my groaning be pleasing to you. But the Holy Spirit will come and minister to us in some of the deepest ways. What you and I have to remember is that what this is all about, that God is still at work. We must remember uh, that we are living in a society where the Holy Spirit has pulled away from our shores. The Holy Spirit is still here. People are still being brought to Christ. uh, he still ministers to you, but understand that there has been a change which has taken place. The way our great nation was shaped as one nation under God is long gone. We are now living in a nation where we see little evidence of the power of God. Um, even so, we are not to turn our backs on God like our nation has. We as believers must hold fast to our faith God is doing incredible things in our world today. We read on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 were saved. And we think, wouldn't that be a wonderful thing to happen today? Uh, it is happening. We have, we have tens of thousands of new disciples uh, that, that come to a saving knowledge every day around the world. The Holy Spirit is moving around the world in incredible ways. Um, Uh, The fact of the matter is that the only reason the Holy Spirit does not move in our lives is because we are not giving him the access that he requires. Remember, the word help us, that was a team effort. So one side is for you, one side's for the Holy Spirit. And so you lift together. So you need to yield to the Spirit of God and be a team member with the Spirit of God and work together. And that's when you accomplish things. We can schedule the Holy Spirit, right out of our lives with such busy activity that we keep, activities which do not pertain to the kingdom of God. And so don't limit the Holy One of Israel out of your lives by your unbelief. Join forces with the Holy Spirit, work together with the Holy Spirit, and see how your life will be transformed. Keep in the front of your minds the worth mentioned earlier. Picture the scale and see which side weighs more, and you will find that the greatest value on that scale to focus upon is on the resurrection, the eternal purposes rather than the worldly temporary things. Amen. I hope this has been helpful and informative, and our next um, uh, video in Romans will be Romans chapter 8, verse 28, very famous verse, um, all the way through to the end of Romans chapter 8. Amen. Good day. Thank you for viewing.